Welcome to CTO Think, a podcast about leadership, product development, and tech decisions between two recovering chief technology officers. Here are your hosts, Don Vandemark and Randy Burgess. Hey, Don, what's on tap for this week? So today we have uh, Greg Pollock with us. Greg is a um, somebody I've known for, for a while here in the Orlando area. He's a major part of the Orlando tech community here. Um, he's done a number of things. I, I remember back in the days of Bar Camp Orlando, Greg being kind of the one who, who organized that. Um, I think that was about the same time Envy, uh, which was a web development firm he was founding, um, as well as he founded Code School, which was a uh, online software programming school that Pluralsight acquired um, for about $36 million, uh, a little while back. And finally, he also uh, founded Starter Studio, which is uh, 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 almost an incubator. Uh, for startups. And and Greg, what, what are they up to now? Are they up to the 10th or 11th cohort now? Yeah, Starter Studio is still going strong down at the Exchange Building here in downtown Orlando. And we're, I think applications are open for our 10th class. It's a awesome. really, you know, all communities need these types of technical accelerators to help the, you know, mostly us developer technical types figure out how to do sales and marketing and create successful products. Right. Well, well, it's great to have you on, Greg. Uh, we, we've had we've had many short conversations over the the past decade, probably. Yeah. Um, so, so great to have you here. Um, so, so the newest venture that that you you founded is View Mastery, which mm-hmm. is really an online resource for Vue JS developers. Mm-hmm. Um, People that want, you want to learn. talk a little bit. Yeah, go go ahead and talk a little bit about what View Mastery does. Yeah, well, it's we're trying to be the ultimate resource for Vue developers, and so that's sort of long term goal. We're building out content, basically producing one video a week to keep you up to date with the technology, or even get you up to speed. And really, it's creating the same sort of really high quality technical learning that I love producing, that I've always loved producing, because I know that your time is valuable as a developer. You only have a limited amount of time to learn. So what I try to do is take concepts out there and really dwindle them down, make them really digestible so that you can sit down, watch a 10 minute video and get up to speed and not feel like you're talking down to uh, and uh, can be really understandable. So um, we're deep into the view community. Not only do we release a video a week on view mastery, but I also pro- help produce the official view news podcast. So if you get into the tech you can stay up to date by watch, by listening to our five, six, seven minute podcast every week where we discuss the latest libraries that you need to know about. Because, you know, no matter what ecosystem you're in, there's new stuff that comes out all the time. And if you want to stay up to date with your tech, you, you need to be consuming it. So we try to sum up all the most uh, useful tidbits in the community so you can just listen to it or even read the newsletter that we help put together, amongst other things. <laughs> so along like for the folks that don't know view that well and they don't yep. know your content there's a lots of people coming into the industry i'm going to take a little sidebar here and just say thank you greg and the team at code school because i forget how many years ago it was but i was a php developer working in the drupal world frustrated with that code and there was a video series called rails for zombies that I watched probably twice um, to get everything. And the amount, everything you just described with about the view courses and content, I can vouch for on the Rails side from a while back as high quality, doesn't talk down to you, very consumable, fun. Like when like when do you see fun anymore in online tutorials like it it kind of went away despite the fact that it worked so well in introducing so many people to rails and css i learned a lot of css through code school stuff so i just want to say that i can vouch for what has been done in the past by your teams and that i personally benefited a ton from what you all produced i got into rails because of what you all are teaching. So anyway. Awesome. That's great to hear. Appreciate it. What Along that line though, um, I've always been very curious about how you, your teams 
have made choices on the technologies that you've chosen to kind of invest in. And there's always a lot of, um, there's a lot of choices that CTOs, technical leaders make to bring technology, what technology and what tools to use for their companies. But you have, you've had to look at it from a number of different perspectives, which are still relevant. And so I'm curious about kind of two paths that you took. Because when you came up in Rails, Python and Django were kind of the other, um, you know, maybe Node was in there too, but you all chose Rails and you invested a ton of time uh, and, and work into the Rails side. And then now we're kind of more on a front end, full stack JavaScript community, you all have chosen Vue. And I'm really curious about what you all, like what your team's assessed and how you made those choices on those two key technologies. Yeah, I'm not sure it was very technical, but I can tell you how <laughs> we got there. Um, sure. So with uh, Rails, so I came from the Java side of the world. Um, I was a big time Java programmer many years ago. Was that probably like 11, 12 years ago? Mm -hmm. I even have one of those Sun certifications. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, wow. The, uh, and uh, when I moved to Orlando, it was around the time, you know, I went to the Java users group here and there was this conference that still goes on called No Fluff, Just Stuff. And I remember going to this conference and at the time, Dave Thomas, who was talking and he was, you know, he used to give a lot of Java talks, but at the time he gave a bunch of Ruby and Rails talks. This was even before Rails was 1.0. Mm -hmm. And he showed Java developers just how easy it can be creating web apps with rails and you know i remember very vividly him showing like look how look how much code i don't have to write and looking around the room and seeing all the jaws of these java developers going how could it be this easy mm. i don't understand <laughs> um so i was like this is really cool what was brilliant about dave is that he ended up writing a book called you know the ad how to what was it? The, the Agile book, the Agile yeah. book for Ruby on Rails. And what was brilliant about that book is that not only did it show you how to create projects in Ruby on Rails, but it kind of showed you how to do consulting work. Mm -hmm. It showed you how to create a project from the, create a web app from the ground up with the client, with, you know, screens and figuring out what, you know, how do you create, how do you do data modeling? How do you build forms? And it gave you all the basics you needed to know. And it so happens around that time, I was out of work and I thought maybe I can make some money doing consulting work. So it provided a recipe for me to start doing consulting work using Ruby on Rails, a technology that was at the time just years and years ahead of everything else out there, including things like Django. It had a bunch of stuff that Django just did not have. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, since then, um, a lot of the frameworks, you know, the, over the years have taken a lot from Rails. And so they don't look all that different anymore. But at the time when it first came out, Rails really had so much new innovation that it just became such a pleasure to code in it. So I started doing consulting work. And then um, started the Ruby users group and through there um, realized, wow, I really enjoy presenting about this stuff. And there was a couple people in the community I really admired and they were presenting. And um, that's really where I found my joy of teaching. Um, and so I one year very quickly after that, I was like, I wonder if I could just like go out and like speak at as many conferences as possible. And of <laughs> course, when you do that, you start to learn that, you know, not all conferences are worth your time, mm -hmm. um, but but still, it, it kind of, I really enjoyed that. And then I had a friend in the Ruby user group that was like, hey, Greg, let's create a blog. I've got, I just bought this domain. It's called Rails Envy. Why don't we just uh, why don't we start blogging in here? I was like, sure. And so I, I started blogging. Whenever I'd write a blog post, man, I, I wouldn't write just like a small post. It would end up being like a guide. And um, I would get so much positive feedback that I was this I'm really enjoying this. So, you know, I just happened to be in the Rails community when I started figuring out my joy for teaching. And then um, I would figure out how every few months to put out educational, free educational content for developers. And then Code School was just me figuring out how to monetize the educational content that I loved producing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the kind of the long story short. Um, how we ended up with Vue was um, with, uh, you know, I left Code School about two years ago now. And what I wanted to do is really, you know, I realized 
if there's one reason I'm put on this earth <laughs> that I can help with innovation, whether it's like to help get, you know, technology that eventually gets a person to Mars or find a cure for cancer, probably the best thing that I can do is mm -hmm. figure out how to um, accelerate the growth of the most innovative open source tech. Mm -hmm. And so for that, it was like we took a look at, out at many different open source projects for sort of the first technology, because we might do this with other technologies eventually. But we, went, we looked out at the ecosystem out there and we wanted to stay with what we're familiar with, which is more web development. And we looked at everything out there. And it was really clear very quickly that Vue you know, um, was a slowly blossoming community. It had not yet mm -hmm. reached mainstream. So there was a huge opportunity to start working in Vue, to start teaching in Vue to help accelerate it into the mainstream and make a big impact. And the other thing that really excited me was besides just picking one tech, because with Code School, like we were all always at the beginning of teaching, right? And we stayed at the beginner content, but I always really wanted to go like deep with one mm -hmm. subject and try that on as a business model. So I'm excited to try that. On top of that, I wanted to build into the business model a way to give back. Mm -hmm. So if you go to viewmastery.com, you'll notice um, when we talk about subscriptions over there, that 25% of our revenue, not profit, 25% of every dollar we make goes back to support the view project itself. Yep. So we're actually giving that back to the project, which is a huge give back. Like um, we wrote a check to the view community for over for almost four thousand dollars last month. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's huge. And I love the fact that we have that built into our business model and ensures that into the future we uh, keep on giving back. Sorry, I know that was a long answer. Oh, oh. I need to mute my. <laughs> <laughs> that was great <laughs> for sure so so let's um i want to talk a little bit about uh, your your the past decade or so has been teaching um yeah. it seems to have been what you've been doing so um i the way i was most exposed to the the courses on code school so uh be, living here in orlando where code school is based every every once in a while you all would put out a, a note saying, hey, we need people to come in and beta test our courses. Um, they're this Friday or this Thursday at seven, come in and, and run through a few lessons. So I did mm -hmm. that probably for four or five different ones. Yeah, um, I remember. So I Appreciate you doing to, that. To, sure. I, I, I was exposed to a few of those. Um, and it's the, the style you all used was, was very um, bright, um, um, engaging. Uh, you had built in uh, an, an editor right within the, the course system itself. Um, it was uh, cartoonish in a positive way, um, not cartoonish as in cheap, cartoonish as in engaging in a way to make it light. So um, when, nowadays it seems that online courses are a bit cookie cutter. Um, if you go to a, a, a site like Udemy, um, even Pluralsight to a small degree is is also um, a little bit commoditized. It seems like very cookie cutter, uh, and and Code School was not that. So, what what? How did you approach how you were going to teach the uh, the the different things that you were you were trying to put out there? Yeah, no. Uh, I, well, what we would do usually with a given technology, um, and I love that we were able to afford to do this, um, is we would sit back and ask, really, like, what would be the optimal w way to learn this? What's the optimal learning environment? And so, not just you know, how do we create an effective video, but how do we engage? How do we? What does learn by doing look like for this given technology? And let's invent the interface from scratch. <laughs> like, oh, um, <laughs> and it, we were in a really unique position there where we could afford to spend like between, you know, 80 and a hundred thousand dollars to produce what really sometimes amounted to just like an hour's worth of video and maybe three more hours worth of exercises between all the videos. Mm -hmm. So it was like a little tiny bit of content, but we got to put so much effort into it. And that's what made it kind of magical was the um, instructional design put together with the videography, put together with um, user interface design, which was different for each technology. So we would kind of reinvent the wheel every time 
we would have a technology because we, you know, some tech, if you're learning HTML, for example, you need HTML on editor on one side, you need the visual on the other side. If you're learning how to do tests, well, you need to be able to run the tests mm-hmm. and get good feedback loop there. If you're learning CSS, you need a different, if you're learning responsive design, I mean, we even created this interface where you could like responsively change the size of the design. So if you were designing for, you know, a uh, for a mobile device, you could change it to that. Or um, just over and over again, we invented these interfaces for learning that um, really was very unique. And that's why, you know, that was kind of our special sauce that we could spend that much effort on a small piece of content, which is hard to do. Like we were in a real sweet spot for a long time. And when I think back to it, like, man, we very quickly were popular because I had spent the last five years before we launched building audience with the rails community Mm -hmm. because then that was just that wasn't to drive towards code school that was to build business for the consultancy sure so i would put out tons of free content all the time to build business for the consultancy and then you know as soon as we put out paid content people were like oh yeah greg's got this thing oh yeah i'll pay for it because he he's put out so much stuff (laughs) and so here i am now with uh, the view community building up a new startup it is not as easy I tell you and online <laughs> learning has kind of become more commoditized you're right it's started to become a little more cookie cutter and it's uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that i mean i'm happy that there's a lot more people doing it but you know there never can be enough online education and there's always room for people like me to step in and create premium content for sure for sure and that that that's certainly what was done there um when so so let's let's bring it around to internal teams. When when you have a, a project that, that you're starting up and and the team itself. So Randy and I have talked before about how do you choose the language you're gonna use to to mm-hmm. to build this project in and and a lot of the time what we came up with was really it's kind of who you have. Um, if yep. if the team you have knows a technology it's probably not a wrong choice. It may not be yeah. the best, but it's probably not a wrong choice. But yep. for whatever reason, you're faced with a, a client or, or a specific need to introduce a new language, a new technology. Um, what would be your advice for how to teach that to a team, to, to a small team of maybe three to six to 10 individuals within your organization? Right. And most, what's the most affordable way to do it? You know, first of all, I totally agree with you. It really matters. It really is all about who ha- who you have on your team, what sort of expertise you have. So I agree with you. First, you take inventory of that. But once you get past that and you sort of, you know, uh, agree to take on a new tech um, and really get your team up to speed, there's all sorts of different ways of doing that. Um, I'm always a big fan of figuring out how to get your team to a training Right. So if you're a big enough company, of course, you can, you know, invite, you know, pay for someone to come on site to give you a two day training. But the more affordable way to do it is just to look out there and see if there's a conference coming up and if there's tutorials attached to that so that you can bring your team, surround them with other people who are learning that technology. Um, You know, like, for example, I think in let's see september uh, in london i'm helping do like a day-long intro to view tutorial that's attached to view london and then i think the next month after that in atlanta there's a con- there's a conference called connect tech which also we're doing a one day view tutorial there and so um you know I, the first thing i would do if i was to adopt a new technology with a team is look for one of these conferences that has a tutorial attached to it so i can just bring my whole team it's also of course you know good for morale to have everybody out at a conference where they get to be surrounded by people who are passionate about what they do and that's also where you can ask them to you know make connections um if you're using a new tech um the also the piece of advice that i often give people is if you don't have a domain expertise if somebody on your team with domain expertise, then Mm -hmm. identify someone outside your company that you can pay, you know, get get them on a contract for maybe three or four hours a week for the next, you know, four months. So that this is the person you can consult with, you know, that you can bring issues to, that you can tell to do code reviews, that you can have pair with your team to do the most difficult tasks um, so they can get up to speed. That way you've got sort of the oversight that you need. It's always important 
I, I'm always amazed at how many teams don't do that. Just find the outside, ex, you know, domain expert. You're going to, obviously they're going to, they're not going to be cheap, but they're going to be worth their weight in gold. Even if you're paying them 150 bucks an hour, they're going to make sure the code that you're writing is premium and that you're not falling into all the same, you know, the pitfalls that you're going to fall into if everybody on your team is new with the technology. Sure. Sure. That, that, that's certainly something I've faced in the past is, is needing to bring in that outside expert. We've got this real thorny problem. My guys are not Postgres um, DB masters. So let's go get someone who really spends the majority of their time doing database work. Yes, we're going to pay them a premium to do it, but they're going to cut right through to the heart of the problem. Um, and the, the mm-hmm. hourly rate may be high, but the number of hours they're going to spend is going to be, be rich and be yeah. um, very fulfilling. Yeah, and, and don't tell anyone this, but I'm not a view master. <laughs> oh my God. Right? Like, I, I have not studied view for two years, but I know the content that I'm producing is premium because why? Why do you think? Because I have a guy that I pay from the view core team that looks over my rough drafts of my scripts and my rough drafts of my videos so that I know I'm creating premium content. I don't have to be an expert to teach it as long as I have the oversight to know that I'm teaching it correctly, efficiently, and entertaining. So you talked earlier about diving deeper. Like one of the things about educating your team on the, on any kind of technology is that there's everyone kind of needs to know the basics together at the same level. But then as your team starts to split off into what they have to, to build, there's needs for learning some more specific edge cases, scaling issues, that kind of thing. And then you talked about wanting to, to dive deeper in your training for Vue compared to you weren't able to always do that with Code School. What are you kind of trying to do with Vue and teaching that deeper, um, the more, I guess, complex or beyond the basics type of learning? What are you all aiming for there? Yeah. So I was always really interested because I would see websites out there like LoraCast, like RailsCast Mm -hmm. going really deep on one tech and they become a reference library rather than a place where people begin to learn. I mean, one of the disadvantages of code school was that even though we were the most entertaining place to start, people would take a course and then they'd go like, what now? What more do you Mm -hmm. have for me? And they'd be like, okay, well, unsubscribe. So you know, our goal is really to become that reference library, not just a place where you go to learn, but we're a place that you have a subscription to. So when you need to learn how to do tabs or how to use a certain library or how to do routing properly, that you check to see if we have a video on mm-hmm. the topic. Unfortunately, it takes it's taking us home, like it takes a while to get there. Um, I'm realizing that's yeah. sort of like uh, one thing I did not foresee is that if we're creating a video a week, like to get to the point where we teach more advanced stuff, we first have to get past the basics. And there's a lot of basics. And if I want to teach them at a high quality level, it just takes mm-hmm. time. So, um, you know, we've got what, like, well, maybe we're approaching about 30 videos on there. They're pretty mm-hmm. high quality, which is good, but we need more. Um, and we already have some really great advanced stuff on there, which even if you're not a Vue developer, if you know JavaScript really well you'll and you're into JavaScript frameworks, you got to check out my advanced components course on Vue Mastery. What's really cool about it too is um, because we work closely with the core team of Vue, in between a lot of the videos that I put up on there, I actually sit down with Evan Yu, the creator mm-hmm. of Vue, and we work on his desktop to go through some of the source code of Vue and like dive into it. So if you're really into JavaScript and into frameworks, um, I think you'd really dig it. Cool. Even if you're not a Vue coder yet, it's really cool to see you know somebody who's an expert talk through the code. I mean, I can speak for, I have been building for the last six, like for the last year I've worked on React stuff last year and a half maybe. And then the last six months started looking at Vue. And I can say with, I guess some, you know, just from my experience, the Vue community feels more like the Rails community. Um, 
Some of it mm-hmm. has to do with Evan. Uh, he, he's definitely less in yep. your face than DHH ever was, but he's also he's also <laughs> way more accessible in that sense. Like you could definitely sit down, mm-hmm. just like you sit down with Evan. I could see myself sitting down with Evan and talking about technology and stuff with him. Whereas with DHH, I think I'd probably just sit there and listen and then let him go do his thing. So I, I, yeah, that's I really feel like the community in view is way more accessible. And I mean, everyone liked rails and this is what DHH had going for him was he made choices and that's kind of what was the recommendation that people did. And he left it flexible to some degree, but, you know, Turbolinks got in there because he's like, this is what people should use. People chose to, like differently, but it's still, there was like a figurehead that a benevolent dictator that just said, hey, this is the the path that Rails development should go. And compared to React, mm-hmm. I would say Vue has that too, but it's with less force. It's just more of, here's the pattern that we follow. Here's why. And that's what I've always been missing in the React community is there's not really a consensus on the best way to build. And I feel like Vue and a lot through your efforts and the Vue core team, we are getting that from the the, on the Vue side. So that's at least what I can speak for as what I've seen in the short time I've been working on some Vue stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I've been pretty happy with the community and the people in it. They're really nice. Um, it's really been fun, especially going to view conferences and talking with all sort of the core developers and the community. Um, you're right. It does feel a lot like the Rails community and everyone uh, really likes each other. It's really neat. So one one uh, one quick story. Um, Randy, do you remember having the conversation of React versus Vue? And and why I said I was I was starting to really pay attention. I don't remember to why you said that. No. I what I said was, look look at this company. Greg Pollock is starting this company called View Mastery. If Greg if Greg's <laughs> on board with you, then it's probably something we should be paying oh, attention well, to. <laughs> well, there's no doubt. I mean, it's a validation for me because of what I said earlier. I I learned Rails a certain way. And I remember what, how I learned it. So if that same group is going to put out content at that same level, then at least that's a huge vote in my book. I think that there's a big gap. Yeah. Um, the problem is a little bit of a gap between the the development community since boot camps kicked in. Don't remember Rails because Rails did not stay at the forefront. Node and back in JavaScript kind of took over at some point. And I don't know, I don't, I feel there's a gap there between who remembers that and, you know, but I, I mean, there's people, I mean, I remember my, I worked at a consultancy and this has nothing to do with Rails teaching, but we were, this whole dev team of engineers took the, the um, iOS, you guys had an iOS emulator for one of your courses. And yeah. we all sat there thinking that looks like the most complex thing they had to do. How are they, how are they getting this to work? Do they just have a bank of iOS devices sitting on like in somebody's closet? Like we were a bunch of engineers were just amazed that this emulator was working online for this type of tech. <laughs> and I think that later on you may have explained uh-huh. how you did it. I can't remember, but I remember just the imp- how people were impressed with that. And it's still like, we don't see, the people are not putting in the same investment and creativity with their courses, which I don't know if that's bad or good for the companies that are producing tons, but it shows. They can afford to. Right. So. Well, I let, let's let let if you don't mind, let me grab that that statement right there. Um, you came up with Rails for Zombies, and it was it was right there. It had it had some good technology in it. It had high production value. Mm-hmm. How did you decide? And and this this speaks to broader investment decisions that people make all the time. How did you decide to invest the time, the money, the energy, the focus? into what you needed to build to teach it your way 
before you actually had the customers on yeah. board to do it, to, to, to validate that you made the right choice. Right. Well, the first kind of interesting thing is Rails for Zombies existed you gotta, before code school, like way, like maybe like seven, eight months before code school. Sure. And it was just another thing that I did for free for the community as a way to help the community and bring in more consulting work. Right. So every few months I would, or like almost every three months, I'd put out some big initiative uh, that was like free education content because I loved putting it out there. I loved helping people. And we put out Rails for Zombies, which was the first time that we combined my style of videos with interactivity because basically we were, there was a website out at the time called Try Ruby, which was allowed you to really type uh, code mm-hmm. in the browser. And this was before Code Academy did it. And um, we were like, what would happen if we did like mm-hmm. Try Rails? We should do that. Maybe combine it with videos. Yeah, let's go ahead and try it. So we put it up there just for free and tons of people found it and tons of people loved it. And then we had people coming at we at that point, one of the big book publishers that I really respect. Well, I have no reason not to say who they are. Um, some of my friends from O'Reilly reached out and basically said, hey, Greg, um, when we get in discussions with the f- about the future of publishing and any conversation, Rails for Zombies always comes up. Like, can we please pay you to like create more of those in some way? <laughs> I always tell people like, pay attention to what people <laughs> want to pay you for. There might be something there. <laughs> so, um, we were like, Oh, Hey, maybe there's something to this. You know, it was that combined with other factors that made us think maybe we should do this again and this time charge for it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's, let's try it. Let's try that. Yeah. Okay. Let's just do the same thing again. Let's create another. Oh, and what if there was like a platform kind of like steam, like a gaming platform? What if there's a platform where, people could buy these courses. So if we make one and people like it, we can make it another. And so that's kind of how code school was born. And, um, then, you know, because we had rails for zombies, when we launched code school, you know, we already had a mailing list of over probably 10,000 people that loved rails for zombies. So we had a means to go upsell. Plus of course, you know, I had, um, really the branding, that we needed and sort of the visibility because I had been pretty visible in the Rails community for the past, um, you know, four years prior that when we when I put out, you know, content that's appealing to Rails developers, everybody kind of jumped on it. So that's really how Code School kind of came to be. And, but that sounds like it was still a significant um, investment of, oh, yeah. of everything, but for, for what was going to be a free um, a, a branding exercise, if I can, if I can boil it down to, to that. And, and, and you, mm-hmm. you, you say it was, it was really to give back to the, to the Rails community, but it was also a branding exercise as well, as far as, Hey, we, 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 we have something that we can provide to the community. And, and we think that the community can learn from this, or we can grow the community, I guess is a better way to put it since it's more of a, an intro course. Yeah, it's, you know, you would, the way to think about it, I think is, you know, uh, it's important if you, you know, either for, to get consulting work or to, to increase your reputation as a company to go speak at conferences, right? That's like one way you go and you increase your visibility as a company and, you know, people want to work there and they respect your company. You, you just go speak at conferences and we would do that all of the time when we do tutorials and all that. And so, you know, doing the online learning is just an extension of that. And that's where Rails for Zombies came. And that's why we're able to legitimize putting so much time and work into it is because it would pay off in the long run. Um, And so Rails for Zombies, yeah, we probably spent probably maybe $20,000 building that, you know, twenty dollars to $30,000 building Rails for Zombies initially. And um, I guess the only reason we could do that is because we knew that those sort of things would pay off. And also I was CEO of the company. So what I wanted to do (laughs) might have had a louder voice (laughs) than others. And I was surrounded by developers, not business people. And so maybe they kind of looked at me like I knew what I was doing. (laughs) (laughs) So so now you've seen online learning from like the, er you were part of the early community that was teaching development and tech skills you sold to a company that has basically built this huge library and now you're back 
in the saddle, so to speak, of building up another set of courses around tech. And you just kind of, you mentioned earlier, you're a little bit, it's not going as fast as you would like, which is you're applying a lot more quality to it. It's going to take some time. But I guess what I'm curious about are what do you see going forward? Where where do you think online learning is going to go um, in terms of like right now, what you've experienced since you left Pluralsight to what you could see happening with what you're building with on the view mastery stuff. Um, well, there's still a ton of opportunity. Um, you know, I always would talk to people and they'd be like, they'd be like, Oh yeah, online learning, the space is really crowded. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, there's always room for more online education. Um, just because it, and that's because it's hard, right? It's hard to put together, you know, uh, to, to really understand hard to learn technical topics, combine that with instructional design ideas to create content that helps people. Um, so there's always room, you know, innovation comes at the intersection of disciplines, right? Mm-hmm. So the intersection of technology and the intersection of teaching. Um, so, you know, I'm really happy to see how many um additional developers are teaching these days. There's still lots of developers out there now that have taken the risk, that have taken the online business courses and followed the rules to create um, these online courses. And the, whether it's publishing through Udemy or creating on their own, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan of people that sort of create the courses on their own and then do the sales and marketing to get the word out there. Mm-hmm. Admittedly, it's harder, but... Um, there's kind of a sentiment I think that I've heard from a few online teachers that's interesting, which is that like Udemy is not doing us any favors, that Udemy is kind of driving down the value mm-hmm. of good online learning because it's just so cheap over there yep. um, to get courses. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I'm happy to see that more teachers are, finding their own path and putting stuff out there. The only thing that, you know, they're always going to struggle. Well, us developers are always going to struggle with when we build products um, of any kind, whether it's teaching or not, is um, taking the time to do sales and marketing. Yeah. Right. I was just talking to a guy, uh, I felt, you know, who uh, he created a course and he's like, yeah, man, I went away for a few months And I just cranked this thing out and it's just this amazing course that has all these examples and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, how many people have bought it? And he's like, six. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, God. And it's probably such good content. But if you don't invest the time, like I always tell entrepreneurs, like you need from day one, if you want to build a company, you got to spend 50% of your time doing sales and marketing Mm -hmm. from day one, like before you build anything. You don't need a product to sell it or market it. Yep. You just don't. Um, you got to start building a mailing list from day one, which is what we did with View Mastery. So View Mastery was interesting because now I had to take uh, eat all the dog food that I was telling everybody else. <laughs> so like back in um, December, we put out a you know the View cheat sheet, right? The yeah. official View cheat sheet, and we yeah. did a nice cheat sheet that had all the beginner syntax, and of course we worked with the. Um, Chris Fritz, who's on the core team there to make sure it had all the great syntax and Damien DeLeash, who's also part of the core team. Um, and so by the time we had paid content, we were approaching maybe like 9,000 emails. Mm-hmm. It's pretty awesome, right? So that's your goal. It's like before you even have the paid content, you got to be building the funnel, right? Because yeah. if you can't have a funnel of continuous customers that are coming in and getting driven to your website, you're just not going to make money. And it's hard. It's still really hard, but it's nice to see more individuals getting into it and doing it well. There's so many more people doing it well right now than there was, you know, five to 10 years ago. Yeah. Do you still think the email list beats out the other forms, the Instagrams, the twi- the Twitter, all like any? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you, the email list is the most important thing because those are, those are where you find people that are engaged with your content. That's your means of reaching out. Um, it's more important than any of the other social media. Not that it's not the other social media is not important. Yeah. Social is really good um, for having conversations, whereas email is more about just letting people know, you know, about coming back to your website, staying engaged, engage with us. Here's more content that we have. Come back, check out this new feature. Um, 
which of course you put on social too, but it's not going to be as effective of drawing, driving customers typically. Yep. Sure. So, so that's, that's all really, really good advice. And, and that's something Randy and I are, are working through ourselves as, as we, we continue to build um, what we've got going. So um, really, really appreciate that advice. Yeah, no problem. Um, so what, what is the, what is coming up in the next year, two years for, for view mastery? Um, uh, one, one thing you didn't mention, I, I don't think is, is if you go straight to, to view, you've produced the, the tutorial video for, for Vue.js um, as yourself, correct? Is it for yourself or is it as part of Vue Mastery? I don't remember how that was branded. It's part of Vue Mastery. So okay. um, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, I wanted, I had a theory <laughs> that I wanted to test and I wanted to use science. And that was, you know, my goal is to help increase engagement with open source. And so my theory was, if we put a video on the front page that really explains the technology well, the theory is the people who watch the video are going to stay more engaged with the technology and more likely to adopt it. And so what we did is we did that first with Bulma, this uh, CSS framework called Bulma. It's at Bulma.io. And the guy who um, runs it was open to us creating that intro video for him. So we did. And we were able, using Google Analytics, um, combined with what Vimeo allows you to do with Google Analytics, to show exactly that. And we did that again. You know, and, and so, like, um, so I can show, using science, that the people using... Uh, who watch the video, stay on the website longer, and view more pages. Thus, you might conclude they're more likely to adopt, mm -hmm. right? Because they're more engaged. So we took that data from Bulma and we brought it to the guys, you know, from View and said, "Hey, we want to create a free video for you guys. Like, we're not going to charge you a dime, but would you be willing to work with us to create a vi the ultimate intro video for View? Because what we found with Bulma is that if you can create this, people stick around longer and they, you know, thankfully were open to it. So we worked real closely with the guys in the core team to produce the ultimate video, put it up there and, and they dug it. And we found the same thing, that the people who watch the video are more likely to engage. Sure. And, and, and that goes right into the, uh, uh, the documentation part of it as well. I, I mean, the videos is great and I, it's one of the ones I watched when I was learning Vue. Um, cool. But the documentation on view was also very, very good. Yeah. Chris Fritz is a brilliant writer. Some of the, some of the technologies don't do that very well. Um, there, there mm -hmm. are certainly things I've started where the, the tutorials were, were very, they were written by people who knew what they were doing, I guess is the best way to put it as opposed oh, to yeah. writing for those who don't know what they're doing. Um, so, so that's totally. always part of that, that learning experience of, of how do you get involved in something new The the resources kind of need to be there. And, and I think views done a great job through, through your video and through the, the documentation they created, um, Thanks. To, to be welcoming. I feel like that speaks to another benefit of, or another attribute of the view community or the view dev team is that they have, and the Ember team actually had this pretty well done too. They had a key leader, they had a great group of developers, and everyone was doing specific roles. So when you brought up documentation, Greg re spoke out about Chris Fritz. Is that the person doing the doc? Yeah. And he's Yeah, doc, and yeah. so you, the problem with a lot of open source areas is that they are, everything is run by a core developer who only cares about coding. And it seems like the view team cares about everything. And they are actually slicing and dicing the work up amongst people that are dedicated to other pieces other than just pure development. And you even said, I'm not a view master, but you certainly are in the mastery level of online learning and video production and high quality marketing in that area. And that's what you're contributing to that community. And it matters, it shows. So I think it that's what that's what Thanks. the view community has going for it. That not and I'm not knocking React. It's just that 
what Facebook is doing as the steward of React is largely engineering focus, and they're catching up on those same attributes that we've kind of had with Vue since it launched um, for the la- at least for the last year or so. So that's what I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And part of that is Chris Fritz and other people who work on the documentation team and how much they care about keeping it accessible mm-hmm. to beginners. And it also, you also have to point back to Evan Yu just because he has a good user interface sensibility, um, user experience yeah. sensibility, um, so that he wanted to create a framework that he knew people could adopt incrementally, one piece at a time, which makes it very accessible to try out and start adopting piece by piece. That that's the it, it fits my philosophy on actually joining companies as well as that that strong leader um, right at the the forefront of things um, really lends to to successful ventures. So, um, what what is what's net on tap next for View Mastery? Uh, to try to become profitable, to <laughs> 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 someday, someday get paid. Um, okay. yeah, we're making money now. We, uh, opened up our paid subscriptions about two months ago, but, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, more than a few months, I think before we are at break even. So right now I'm just putting my own money into the project, um, and, uh, keeping the team small. So we're hoping that we can become sustainable within a couple months. We'll see how it goes, you know, as a startup. So there's no guarantee, um, which is really scary um, because it's not like we're, we've got a hockey stick going on or anything. It's just slow and steady. So we're going to, we're having a lot of fun, you know, I just accept the fear. And so I'm all about trying to, I'm going to try to embrace the fear. (laughs) Certainly a part of me that's afraid (laughs) of got paying subscribers and people subscribe for a year and we're on the hook and we need to be sustainable eventually but will it happen i don't know but that's why i like startups yeah they're you know they're they're scary but it also means that um they're exciting as well yeah the the excitement is certainly what why why i'm i'm engaged in 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 startups as well go ahead randy well i guess the the question i will I'll, I'll end my questions on, on this, and I'm not expecting you to be the sales spokesperson, salesperson for VUE, but if a technology leader is coming to this point where the fork in the road, they can go the Angular route, the React route, or the VUE route, what, like, what would you tell them? One, why is VUE a, what are the points of view that you think are worth strong consideration, not necessarily kicking the other two out. And then two, what's the best way for them to get started? And Vue Mastery, you've talked a lot about, but what would you say, like, you want, you, you've chosen Vue, what, what do you do next? Those, I guess those are the two questions I have. Why would you want to consider it? Because I mean, well, number one, it has all the features of a modern web framework and you want to use a modern web framework. So you're going to want to pick something that is established. So now you're looking at React, Vue, or Angular, right? Yep. So let's let's just say that, you know, it's wise to pick a framework that's well supported, that has like a community, that has a library behind it. Yep. So at least you got to get that far. Then when you compare them all, um, I think the how easy view is to adopt is a huge selling point. You don't have to learn a whole lot. It has a great friendly community. Like you said earlier, it has amazing documentation. That's really important. Um, and what's great about it is it's, I mentioned earlier too, it's incrementally adoptable, which means you don't have to, you know, start adopt the whole view philosophy at first and do things the view way and walk down the golden path. You can pick a small piece of your project that you could do in view and just give it a try and get your team starting to get familiar with it. You don't have to invest a ton of money into education. You have one person on your team that wants to try it out, you know, find a small task for them to try it out on. If there's a small project, um, and then, you know, if you've got a big project and you just try it with a small piece, then maybe you move on to a bigger piece. Um, the other big thing is um, how Vue allows you to do um, single file view components, which I think are, a, once you get into them, are a really big selling point. Mm-hmm. So this is a way that you end up creating web components where you've got a one file 
that contains your template, your JavaScript, and your CSS, mm -hmm. and your scoped CSS, right? So um, once you start looking at this and you start realizing, oh, wow, if I'm designing in components, it makes a lot of sense for me to have all these pieces in a single file instead of spread out in a weird way. Um, it just feels, something about it just feels right. And, you know, with the, with, um, React, when I got into that and taught even a little bit, help people teach it, what I couldn't get over is how people were putting HTML, I know it's like XHTML, inside of their JavaScript. Yeah. I got flashbacks to Java servlets. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I did Java servlets. I put HTML inside my Java code. It was ugly. Everyone realized it was a bad idea and we moved on. And so, I, but, you know, it goes back and forth. And I know there's ways in React to keep your templates separate, which is cool. You, you know, do that. But I just like the fact that, you know, uh, that it, this is supported inside Vue as sort of the best practice. Um, what are the things? Um, a, a lot of the great things in the community that allow you to, um, oh, what else? In, in the community, in the library, I think yeah. the libraries that are supported are, are out there. Um, and are moving pretty quickly into the future. You know, I want to invest in a framework that is that is cutting edge, but it's doing so in a way that's sustainable, that is not um, going to, you know, I don't feel like I have to upgrade every few months, and it really feels like Vue is on the the, the track there. Yeah. Um, so the next question you had was about getting my team up to speed. Over on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion just because I do that. Um, I'm not ashamed to market. Um, but if you go to viewmastery.com, we have a free beginner course over there. There's like 11, 12 videos that are completely free that are great for getting up to speed with Vue. There's even little code challenges in there if you want to play around with it. The nice thing about Vue is you can jump into you know, a plunker or a code pen and quickly start um, just fooling around, yeah. having some fun with it. It's very quick to pick up. Um, so if I was to get a team up to speed, I would maybe throw them over to View Mastery, check it out and get up to speed that way. Of course, also check out the official documentation. And there, of course, there's lots of free content out there on the web. You're, you know, you're not going to pick up one book. So I'm not going to tell you that View Mastery is the end all be all, but um, you know, because you're going to learn new technology, you're not going to pick up just yeah. one book. You're going to do several books. So, um, I, yeah, so I, I think that's a good starting point. Start a view mastery, go to documentation, and then uh, see what else you find in the ecosystem. Cool. And if you have like a subscription to like a plural site or something, they've got courses too. <laughs> well, let me, well, I was going to add those, a selling point that I would bring up if you are asked this again, and this is what I noticed the difference between the two. When it comes to core React, pretty much you have one way to do the the basics of React. But then as soon as you reach for the router piece or the state management piece, you are jumping into areas of React that aren't supported by the core React team. And when you, mm, when you use Vue, I'm using a router that the Vue team is supporting. A pa there are conventions yep. in place that I don't have to sit there and guess. Mm -hmm. How do I use this best? Yep. And the same with, I haven't even used the view state management piece because I'm like, I don't think I need it. UX. Yeah. I, I haven't even mm -hmm. needed it. Whereas I've all, and with the React world, I've always constantly asking, do I need, need MobX? Do I need Redux? Do I need Relay? And then does anyone care to keep those going because of something else that pops up? And so there's a, yeah, it's really nice that it's all built yeah, in. Yeah, there's, there's a significant trust I have with the Vue team. And, and I admit, I have not built mm -hmm. a lot with Vue yet, but I feel confident that the Vue core team is supporting more of the additional thing tools I'll need to work with Vue. And that's as a CTO, yep. I want my team to be, I want to make bets on tech. I want to make bets like that. Um, myself. So that's just, that's mm -hmm. a selling point that I've noticed just with very, I built one app in Vue and thought this is significantly different. And this is why I like working with this tool right now. So sorry, Don, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. No, that, that, that's a really good point. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. So I, I think we'll wrap here. One thing I did want to say, uh, you mentioned your advanced components course uh, earlier and um 
be again being here in Orlando, I get to see previews of things, and I think part of that advanced components <laughs> yeah. is the the one talk you gave at uh, at the Orlando JS group mm-hmm. about about reactivity within Vue, and you were absolutely yep. correct. It, you didn't have to know Vue for it. It was it was very JavaScript heavy, very hey, learn how JavaScript works is essentially what it came down to. So it, it really broke it down really well. I, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, and I, I think... Thanks, I really appreciate that. Yeah, your, your advanced component, I guess, is just a, a bigger version of that. Yeah, it's a more detailed, more high quality. Um, because sure. yeah, w- w- when it comes down to whatever framework you're going to use, if you really want to be confident scaling it, you know, using having your team use it, then the best thing you can do is, is get a feel for what's going on under the hood, what's going on on the internals. It's going to make it easier to debug and scale and even extend it if you need to. And so that's really what I do inside of that advanced components course. I give you what you need to know kind of internally about how Vue is functioning so you have a little more confidence in using it. Because I know as a developer, I would always get nervous the more other people's code I would (laughs) use because I don't know what's really going on under the hood. I want to know because I want to be able to dive in there and really be able to debug. Um, And so... I think, you know, with taking the advanced components, of course, you're going to end up feeling much more confident understanding how Vue works and how it's laid out so that when you run into problems, you can debug them much more effectively, confidently, sure. dive into the source code if you need to. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Greg, for joining us today. I yes. think we hit a number of things and, and I'm really appreciative of, of you taking the time out of your day today. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate uh, talking with you guys and all of the uh, the kind words that you sent my way. Sure, this did turn into the grand po- the the Greg Pollock fan club, but that's okay. Uh, we're okay with that. Here, so. All right. Well, thank you again, and uh, Randy, we will talk again soon. Yep. Later. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the CTO Think podcast. Show notes and previous episodes can be found on our website at ctothink.com. Reviews on Apple iTunes are always appreciated and help promote the show. Patreon contributions help us to produce episode transcripts, which allow people that are deaf or hard of hearing to access the show. If you have feedback, ideas, or want to be a guest, please email us at hello at ctothink.com. Show music is Dumpster Dive by Mark Wallach, licensed by premiumbeat.com. Voiceover work by meganvoices.com. You'll hear from us next week. Thank you.